Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Needs to be judged on its own merits. I am satisfied, satisfied, there are compelling and obvious reasons to investigate allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. As I have said, Sir Edward Heath was an extremely prominent, influential and high profile person who was arguably one of the most powerful people in the world commensurate with the public office and political office he held. The allegations against him were of the utmost seriousness and from a significant number of people. I hope people will understand that given these circumstances, it would be an indefensible dereliction of a Chief Constable's duty not to have investigated the allegations against a former Prime Minister, even though he is deceased. I have made it clear from the outset that at the end of this investigation, in line with our intention to be as transparent and as open as possible, we would publish a summary closure report, and that is what we have done today. The publication of this report is also in line with advice issued by Operation Hydrant. The report has been scrutinised by a number of stakeholders and contributors to ensure complete balance, complete accuracy and measure and only makes findings that can legitimately and realistically be made. The report provides a factual account of, of, a, of the context for this investigation, what the investigation focused upon and how the investigation was conducted. Operation Conifer by its very nature was complex, politically sensitive <coughs> and unique. Due to these unprecedented circumstances, I have sought advice, counsel and support throughout this investigation from a number of people. That confidentiality between me and those individuals will remain intact. <coughs> the role of the police service is very clear in the criminal justice process. The police have a duty to investigate and go where the evidence takes us. It is not our role to prove the innocence or guilt, but to simply present the facts. Therefore, this report does not apportion guilt. It does not suggest or conclude guilt. And no inference should be taken from the investigative decisions or conclusions being made by the police. Extreme caution has been given so that no assumptions, no assumptions are publicly drawn about truths or untruths. The presumption of innocence is enshrined in our law and it is the cornerstone of a just and fair process, judicial process. Despite misleading and inaccurate commentary, nobody from this investigation team or I have made any public or private comment or inference <coughs> as to the hypothetical outcome of a judicial process if Sir Edward Heath were alive. Any such comments or hypotheses would be flawed by their very nature. They are misleading and they distort the criminal justice process. Wiltshire Police has and will continue to do all that we are able to protect the anonymity of those people who have come forward. This report will therefore not identify the details of any people who have made disclosures of sexual abuse. I understand that there is an insatiable appetite by some to identify the victims. I will do everything in my power to prevent this from happening and I would urge all of you here present today to respect what I am saying about anonymity. In order that this investigation has remained ethical, justified and proportionate, an independent scrutiny panel was established to check and challenge the investigation. <coughs> the panel members were given responsibility to examine and test the decision making and the approach by the investigation team. The panel has been provided with detailed briefings, materials 
and more recently full access to the published report. This scrutiny has proved invaluable and enabled Operation Conifer to remain firmly aligned to the legislation and to the objectives of this investigation. I would like to thank the members of the panel for their time, for their expertise, their challenge and their support to this investigation. In addition to the independent scrutiny panel, Operation Hydrant was asked to conduct two reviews of the investigation itself. Both reviews of the investigation concluded that it was proportionate, it was justified, and it was in compliance with the legislation and guidance. Further scrutiny has taken place during the course of this investigation with a value for money review by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, which was commissioned by the Home Office further to an application of central funding. This review concluded that the resources deployed on this investigation had been proportionate and reasonable and commensurate with the scale of the investigation. They made particular reference to the strong governance, the strict financial controls and the staffing levels which were kept to a minimum with low associated costs. In total, 24 people have worked on Operation Conifer at varying points in the last two years. The cost of the investigation is £1.5 million. The Home Secretary has recently approved the Home Office funding of £1.1 million to take into account that this was a national operation, a national investigation, and it was carried out on behalf of the National Police Chiefs Council and commissioned by Operation <coughs> Hydrant. This decision, made by the Home Secretary, I believe undermines the Prime Minister's personal commitment to addressing child abuse that has gone on in the past, as Mrs May said last week, that tended to be sidelined. During the last two years, there has been much commentary in relation to the potential for a judge-led review into Operation Conifer. At this time, I have heard no compelling reasons for such a review, and therefore, I am not persuaded to follow this course of action. As I have said, I am clear that it is not the role of the police to judge the guilt or innocence of people, and it is obvious that at the end of this investigation, concerning a deceased suspect, there is no potential for a criminal trial. Most of the elements of the criminal justice process are absent. It is my view the suggestion that a retired judge or other judicial appointments could legitimately pronounce the guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath <coughs> is ill-conceived. I believe this would neither provide value for money or indeed a legitimate outcome of the guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath. Throughout this investigation I have been very clear that Wiltshire Police <coughs> will be as open and as transparent as possible in line with our requirement for the police to, be, to remain accountable to the public. It is only right when an investigation with such significance is conducted, people like me, who make these decisions, should be held to account. The public should be able to judge the leadership of such high profile operations based upon the merit and quality of the investigation that has taken place, not misleading speculation rumour and inaccurate conjecture. The publication of the summary closure report today <coughs> provides the openness, provides the transparency and provides the public accountability that I, said, that I said there would be. And the report author has complied fully with Operation Hydrant advice on publication. It will now be a matter for others to evaluate and decide what steps should be taken in relation to the Operation Conifer findings. I recognise that this investigation, the findings and the summary closure report may raise further questions. But I also believe it signals a watershed moment for people and victims who have suggested or implied there has been a state cover-up for some senior figures who may have been involved in child sexual abuse. As many people will know, ICSA, 
The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse was set up in March 2015 by the then Home Secretary, now Prime Minister Theresa May. The inquiry was clear from the outset that it was required to identify the extent to which state or non-state institutions have failed in their duty of care to protect children from child sexual abuse. I acknowledge the terms of reference which are currently publicised on the ICSA website regarding allegations of sexual abuse and exploitation by people of public prominence associated with Westminster. I particularly welcome their focus, focus upon allegations of institutional cover-up and conspiracy and they will review the inadequacies of law enforcement responses to the allegations. <laughs> In light of this, I believe the legitimacy, the legality and the obvious public interest in this investigation is more relevant and is more crucial today than ever before. The public interest in this case is clear and unequivocal. The statutory responsibility as the Chief Constable to, to have conducted this investigation without fear, without favour, I trust is now obvious to all. Thank you, Chief Constable. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Ms. Seville has set out, I have been the Police Gold Commander for Operation Conifer and have set the strategic direction and oversight for the investigation. On a daily basis, the investigation has been led by the Senior Investigating Officer, Detective Superintendent Steve Kirby and his team. My purpose today is to outline the key elements that relate to the investigation. These are contained within the summary closure report. Accordingly, I will look to set out how the investigation commenced, the policing duty to undertake an investigation in the case of a deceased person, the allegations that have been received and how these have been investigated, and finally, the investigative findings. For those not familiar with the background to the Operation Conifer investigation, it commenced in August 2015 further to a press statement released by the Independent Police Complaints Commission that announced that they were investigating the way that Wiltshire Police had allegedly dealt with a court case in 1994. In the press release, the IPCC outlined that it is its investigation was directly linked to how Wiltshire Police had dealt with information concerning an allegation that Sir Edward Heath may have been involved in the child abuse related offences. The IPCC press statement released into the public domain for the first time the existence of an allegation relating to Sir Edward Heath. Not in the public domain at that time was that four other police forces were also in the early stages of either scoping or undertaking investigations relating to further allegations that had been made against Sir Edward Heath. Set against this context, Wiltshire Police made the decision to make a public appeal on the same day as the IPCC for anyone with information concerning Sir Edward Heath to come forward. In the following two weeks, 118 people contacted Wiltshire Police, other police forces, other agencies, providing information in response to that media appeal. By the end of August 2015, 23 separate victim disclosures had been made against Sir Edward Heath, spanning offending locations covering 11 different police forces. Due to the extent and range of information received, a decision was made nationally by the police service that a consistent, coordinated response was required to investigate the allegations that had been made. As a result, Wiltshire Police were appointed to take the national investigative lead in relation to all existing and any new allegations made against Sir Edward Heath and the Operation Conifer investigation was commenced. During the course of the Operation Conifer investigation, there has been an ongoing commentary in the media concerning the rationale for undertaking an investigation into a deceased person. Accordingly, this is an important question to address. As the Chief Constable touched upon, the College of Policing issued advice to all police forces in 2015 on this issue. 
the advice sets out that there is a legal duty under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights for police forces to proportionately investigate criminal allegations made against deceased persons. The advice states that the closer the alleged suspect is to the state and the more serious the allegations made against them, then the greater the duty to investigate is. In the case of Sir Edward Heath, due to his public prominence and the office that he held as Prime Minister, this was particularly relevant in relation to the decision to investigate the allegations made against him. The Operation Conifer investigation has followed the College of Policing advice relating to the purpose of an investigation into a deceased person and throughout has focused on the following four key strategic objectives. Firstly, identifying and safeguarding children and vulnerable adults who may be at risk of abuse today. Secondly, seeking to establish the facts concerning allegations of child abuse made against Sir Edward Heath through an objective and proportionate investigation. Thirdly, identifying and where possible bringing to justice any living person who may have committed criminal offences relating to child abuse or associated cover-up. And fourthly, and importantly, attempting to provide public confidence in the police response to allegations that were made. Throughout the investigation, the starting point has always been to consider any current safeguarding issues and whether or not there were allegations made against suspects who were still living. The facts that Edward Heath died in 2005 ensured this remained a realistic possibility and such risks may be present. I now turn to the allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. During the course of the two-year investigation, Operation Conifer received victim disclosures relating to 42 purported individuals. Each disclosure alleged criminal offences had taken place where Sir Edward Heath was the named perpetrator. The disclosures were made either directly by the victim, anonymously, or by a third party, either on behalf of the victim or without their knowledge. The disclosures made ultimately covered 14 different police force areas in the United Kingdom and the Channel Islands. Nine disclosures were made prior to the IPCC and Wiltshire Police press releases in August 2015. The remaining 33 disclosures were received during the course of the two-year Operation Conifer investigation. 34 of the disclosures were made directly to police forces, while seven were made to the NSPCC and one was made to the Independent Inquiry into Child Abuse. During the investigation, it became apparent that one person had made three separate disclosures to the Operation Conifer investigation, where they had purported to be three different individuals. Accordingly, the actual number of distinct people who made disclosures was concluded to be 40 and not 42. The disclosures and the offences spanned from 1956 to 1992, and each was alleged to have occurred while Sir Edward Heath was a publicly elected Member of Parliament. Two of the offences were alleged to have taken place during the time period 1970 to 1974, when he served as the Prime Minister. The disclosures made against Sir Edward Heath related to offences of child sexual abuse, physical abuse and sexual abuse involving an adult. The level of seriousness of the child sexual abuse disclosures made included allegations of offences of rape and indecent assault against children. <coughs> I now turn to the investigative response. For each of the 42 disclosures that were alleged against Edward Heath, a proportionate investigation has been undertaken. This has been regardless of whether the disclosures were received by way of a direct report through a third party or anonymously. The policing purpose in any investigation is to objectively gather facts and go where the evidence takes us. And the approach adopted during the Operation Conifer investigation was no different. The starting point for each disclosure was to attempt to obtain an account from the, alleged, uh, from the victim who had alleged abuse against Sir Edward Heath. In 24 cases, the investigation was able to obtain a direct account from the victim. In these cases, 
a victim care plan was put in place which was tailored to each person's individual needs. In the case of the other 18 disclosures, due to the fact that they had been made by a third party anonymously or the victim declined to engage further with the investigation, it was not possible to gain a direct, more detailed account. <coughs> Regardless of whether or not a direct victim account could be obtained, the initial approach of the investigation was to consider whether or not there was any living alleged offenders or wider safeguarding considerations. Once these considerations had been addressed, the focus of the investigation was to objectively and proportionately gather any available corroborative evidence. In addition, the investigation considered if there was any apparent, identifiable, evidential inconsistencies relating to the victim disclosure made. Throughout the investigation, there was an attempt to ensure that all inquiries were proportionate, recognising that Sir Edward Heath was deceased and there was no prospect of an evidential file being prepared for the Crown Prosecution Service. As part of this approach, an investigative proportionality matrix was developed to assist decision making. And this led to a number of, number of potential investigative lines of inquiry not being progressed as they were considered disproportionate. This is in contrast to the additional reasonable lines of inquiry that would have been pursued had Sir Edward Heath been alive today. The fact the allegations spanned four decades meant that many of the investigative opportunities that would be available in the criminal investigation today were not available. Additionally, the passage of time between the date of the alleged offending and the subsequent report to the police meant that in certain instances, people's recollections had deteriorated over time and potentially relevant documentary records had been routinely and lawfully destroyed. The investigation team therefore had to focus on available ev ev evidential opportunities, which included interviewing individuals who knew Sir Edward Heath, reviewing physical records and identifying independent witnesses. During the course of the investigation, 1,580 investigative lines of inquiry were generated. 1,062 officers' reports were completed and 284 statements were taken or reviewed. In addition to focusing on the availability of evidence to corroborate disclosures that had been made, the investigation also undertook wider proportionate inquiries. These included, but were not limited to, speaking to the following. Close protective process, Detective Superintendent Kirby has considered the available evidence and information gathered during the investigation and has concluded a finding in relation to each disclosure made. I now turn to those findings. Firstly, I just want to touch upon the opening comments made by the Chief Constable concerning the role of the police in a criminal investigation. Mr Veal purposefully set out the role of the police is to inve investigate the facts and follow the available evidence. It is not for the police to make comment on the, on the issue of innocence or guilt, and to do so would significantly go beyond the policing role and purpose. Mr Veal also touched on the fact that the presumption of innocence until proven guilty is enshrined in our legal system and is a cornerstone of a just and fair society. These factors are critical to the investigation into Sir Edward Heath, who as a deceased person, firstly, has not had the opportunity to be interviewed by the police and to respond to the criminal allegations that have been made against him. Secondly, it is national policy that the Crown Prosecution Service will not make a decision as to whether or not the threshold to charge is reached in cases where the suspect is deceased. And finally, only a criminal court can make findings in relation to whether a person charged with offences is guilty or not guilty of offences alleged against them. For each of these reasons, the Operation Conifer Summary Closure Report does not make any conclusions in respect to, to Sir Edward Heath's guilt or otherwise. The National Operation Hydrant Advice concerning the publications of findings does, however, leave it open to the police to conclude if the suspect had been alive whether or not they would have been interviewed under caution in order to establish an account. We have adopted this advice as it appropriately reflects the policing role in an investigation 
and it transparently allows victims who have made disclosures to understand what the next policing step would have been if Sir Edward Heath would have been alive today. The Operation Conifer investigation developed a categorisation approach to conclude the outcome for each individual disclosure made. A decision as to where the victim disclosure was concluded to sit within that categorisation was based on an objective assessment by the senior investigating officer of all the available evidence at the conclusion of the investigation. To ensure a consistent approach, an independent panel of relevant senior investigating officers from outside of Wiltshire Police was also commissioned to review the conclusions reached on the categorisation of victim disclosures. So what are our findings? In the case of seven individual disclosures, if Sir Edward Heath had been alive today, it has been concluded he would have been interviewed under caution in order to obtain his account in relation to the allegations made against him. It is important to state that in the case of one of these disclosures, the investigation has gathered information that potentially undermines the victim's account. The offences where he would have been interviewed under caution are one allegation of rape of a male under 16, three allegations of indecent assault on a male under 16, four allegations of indecent assault on a male under 14, and two allegations of indecent, as assault, indecent assault on a male over 16. The purpose of interviewing Sir Edward Heath under caution would have been to obtain his account in relation to the allegations that have been made against him. It is clearly inappropriate to speculate what his response would have been to the allegations put to him, and no inference of guilt should be drawn by the decision to interview him. His account would have been as important as other information and evidence gathered as part of the wider investigation and would have informed the next stages of the investigative strategy. It is important to further state that none of the victim disclosures in this category relate to the time when he was the serving Prime Minister. In the case of 19 individual disclosures, it has been concluded there is undermining information available such that the threshold to interview under caution would not be met. In relation to these disclosures, it has been concluded that either the alleged abuse could not have taken place in the manner and the circumstances that were reported, and or there is information available at the conclusion of the investigation that impacts upon the credibility of the person making the disclosure. In these cases, the extent and type of undermining information was specific to each individual disclosure investigated. In certain instances, the level of undermining evidence was significant. In others, it was less so. Some of the factors taken into account when considering these disclosures included whether the account could have physically taken place as reported, whether there were inconsistencies in relation to the timing or location of the alleged offending, whether there was the existence of third-party material that contradicted the account given, and whether there was available witness evidence that contradicted the disclosure made by the victim. In the case of two people who fall within this category, the senior investigating officer has concluded that there is reason to suspect that the individuals may have attempted to, in attempted to intentionally mislead the police by alleging that they were abused by Sir Edward Heath. In the case of one of these disclosures, a live criminal investigation remains ongoing. In the case of the other, a criminal investigation was undertaken and an individual was formally cautioned for an offence of wasting police time. In relation to the other disclosures made to Operation Conifer, in the case of three disclosures, the person reporting alleged abuse has subsequently concluded that they were genuinely mistaken in naming Sir Edward Heath as the perpetrator. <coughs> In the case of 10 disclosures, the alleged abuse was reported by a third party. In the case of another three, the victim reported the alleged abuse anonymously. In the case of these respective disclosures, no findings have been concluded. Additionally, during the course of the Operation Conifer investigation, three people were arrested in relation to offences concerning alleged non-recent child abuse. 
Two were later released without charge, and the third remains under investigation. The relevant allegations were disclosed as a result of the Operation Conifer investigation, but the subsequent investigation confirmed that they were not directly related to Sir Edward Heath. So in conclusion, firstly, as the Operation Conifer Gold Commander, I am satisfied that on behalf of the 14 police forces concerned, a proportionate investigation has been undertaken in line with national guidance into the allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. Secondly, I am satisfied that each of the strategic objectives set at the start of the investigation has been completed. I now return to the Chief Constable for his closing remarks. Thank you, Paul. Let me finish by saying this. Firstly, I want to send a specific message to those who have come forward as part of this investigation. I know it takes bravery and I know it takes courage to do so. I hope that you feel as though we have listened to you, we have taken you seriously, we have supported you, we have protected you, and that you have been treated with dignity and respect. People who are victims of abuse in the past, now or in the future should be reassured. Reassured by the way that Wiltshire Police has listened to victims and survivors and reassured that no matter who the alleged perpetrator of abuse is, we will take your allegations seriously. We will investigate no matter how difficult that may be. That said, I will remind you again that this investigation has drawn no inference about Sir Edward Heath's guilt or innocence in this case. Operation Conifer has now come to an end and the ICSA's terms of reference are clear. This watershed moment regarding investigations of people connected to the establishment should not be underestimated. When the Prime Minister was the Home Secretary, she said in Parliament, we have to send a very clear message to everyone involved in child protection and there can be no excuse for failing to protect them or failing to per bring perpetrators to justice. Finally, I would like to recognise and thank the Operation Conifer investigation team. The scrutiny panel believes that this investigation was fair, was sensitive and was rigorous. This applies to complainants and suspects, including Sir Edward Heath. I am proud of the team's compassion and sensitivity towards victims and survivors throughout this investigation. The team have conducted themselves with diligence and expertise. Their values has enabled this investigation to be, can be concluded and completed to the letter of the National Police Chief's guidance. They have not buckled under the pr pressure of relentless external speculation and criticism. They have never lost sight of the need to fulfil the pr principles of this investigation. They have maintained the highest standards of professionalism in the face of persistent negative commentary to ensure that this investigation has not been hijacked and has not been derailed. For that and for their commitment and for their dedication for carrying out their roles without fear or favour, they should be commended and I thank every single one of them for their service. Thank you. Thank you everybody. That now concludes the live part of the briefing. There'll be a short break and we'll be coming back to do the uh, question and answer session with the print journalist which will be off camera. So the uh, police there not taking any questions uh, are at the conclusion of Operation uh, Conifer, saying they weren't drawing any conclusions about Sir Edward Heath's behaviour, but perhaps it was a slip of the tongue uh, that the police chief referred to the people making the allegations as victims uh, rather than alleged victims. Now, the former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, would have been questioned over sex abuse claims if he was alive when they came to light, police have said today. Wiltshire police launched Operation Conifer in 2015 when he was accused of historical child sex abuse. The Conservative politician would have been interviewed under caution over seven claims, including the alleged rape of an 11-year-old, they said. They also stressed that no inference of guilt should be drawn from this fact. I am satisfied, satisfied, there were compelling and obvious reasons to investigate allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. As I have said, Sir Edward Heath was an extremely prominent, influential and high-profile person 
who was arguably one of the most powerful people in the world, commensurate with the public office and political office he held. The allegations against him were of the utmost seriousness and from a significant number of people. I hope people will understand that given these circumstances, it would be an indefensible dereliction of a Chief Constable's duty not to have investigated the allegations against a former Prime Minister, even though he is deceased. And our correspondent Helena Lee is in Swindon for us, where Wiltshire Police have published their report. Thank you very much for joining us. They are obviously defending their right to have investigated these claims because they came under a lot of fire for doing so, bearing in mind Ted Heath has been dead for you know, many years. Well, absolutely. And you just heard there from the chief constable, he gave a very strong defence in terms of their investigation into these allegations against Sir Edward Heath, who's now been dead for 12 years. Uh, the chief constable said in that news conference earlier on, he believed it was the right moral, ethical and professional thing to do. What he did stress, though, again and again, is that even though these allegations have been brought to light and made public today, that it doesn't mean that Sir Edward Heath is guilty and it doesn't mean that he is innocent. But you may remember, Joe, that very high profile news conference that officers held outside of Sir Edward Heath's home here in Wiltshire, where he used to live, where they appealed for alleged victims to come forward. But it's been criticised today by those who support Sir Edward Heath. Many feel, as you say, he's no longer alive. He's a man who cannot defend himself in terms of these allegations. And they say there's a cloud of suspicion that will continue to hang over Sir Edward Heath's, rep Heath's reputation. Uh, what happens next? Well, we know that the independent inquiry into the uh, child sexual abuse uh, inquiry, they have now requested that report from Wiltshire Police here. They will look at that report, but the Crown Prosecution, they simply cannot comment on the strength of evidence given that Sir Edward Heath is no longer alive. Helena Lee, thank you very much for joining us. Wiltshire police say they would have questioned the former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, about allegations of historical child abuse if he were still alive. The claims include the alleged rape of a child. The police stress that is not to say the former Prime Minister was guilty. But the investigation has been severely criticised by Sir Edward's friends and family and by the former head of public prosecutions. He says elements of Wiltshire police's investigation were a disgrace and they should be ashamed. Tom Simons has more. For many, he's now a figure from distant history. The Prime Minister in the early 1970s who took us into Europe. But today, the police set out staggering claims against Sir Edward Heath. That he raped a child in 1961, indecently assaulted six others, children and adults. They've been bitterly criticised for an inquiry which could never answer the central question of guilt. The police say they've done the right thing for his accusers. They deserve to be listened to. They deserve to know that they will be taken seriously. They deserve to know the police will support them. Forty people made allegations. Police found problems with the majority of their accounts. But in seven cases, there was enough evidence to justify Sir Edward being questioned under caution, had he still been alive. These claims span the period between 1961 and 1992, but not his time as Prime Minister. There is a similar pattern of alleged behaviour in three cases, that he paid for sexual encounters. But how much evidence is needed for a suspect to be questioned? The threshold for um, interviewing somebody after caution is very low, and many innocent people are interviewed after caution. That is, far, that is as far as the legislation will allow me to go, and that is as far as I'm willing to go in relation to this investigation. But the obvious outcome of that discussion is that you have, and there's really no other way of putting this, tainted the reputation of a man who can only be innocent under the law. Well, I think the guidance is clear, and I think when people read the report, they will see that it's been put together very carefully, very precisely, so that people don't draw that inference. But that's exactly what his friends and supporters say has happened, and today they demanded a judge be allowed to review the evidence. There will always be a, a number of people who will not wish to be persuaded, 
and I'm afraid there's probably not much we can do about those, but we want to do our best to give his reputation a fair chance because we think he'll be exonerated. But why did the investigation start? Lawyers for Wiltshire Police advised that people who made allegations of sexual abuse had a right to an investigation, a human right, especially if the person accused was powerful. And the force said it already had five allegations when in 2015 it made a controversial appeal for victims in front of Sir Edward's former home. I'm really appealing for anybody that's been a victim of crime or is a, a witness to anything that may have taken place uh, involving Sir Ted Heath, please come forward. The former prosecutor, Lord MacDonald, dismisses suggestions Sir Edward would have been questioned. This gives entirely bogus credibility to their investigation, he said, without meaning anything in forensic terms. They are covering their backs at the expense of a dead man. Shame on them. But this report now takes its place in Sir Edward's history. It'll be passed to the National Child Abuse Inquiry and an unedited version will be placed top secret into government archives. Well, Tom is in Swindon for us where the police were speaking earlier. And Tom, Wiltshire police clearly felt they had to make this report, their investigations public, but it hasn't silenced their critics, has it? And I don't think it's going to, Fiona. Throughout this two-year process, this investigation, there has been constant uh, bitter criticism of uh, the inquiry. And I think Wiltshire was very much trying to prove and show today that this was a proportionate investigation, a fair investigation, one that took the concerns of those who'd made the allegations very seriously. It was the first time that we saw really in full uh, the uh, summary of the evidence that the police were prepared to make public. But I think it's fair to say that that wasn't the problem for the police. The problem was that they were never going to be able to say whether Sir Edward was guilty or not guilty of these allegations. And the flip side of that problem is that even though they weren't be able to, going to be able to say that, publishing the report will tarnish his memory. And I think that is going to be uh, at the centre of the criticism. The force and any force that investigates this sort of uh, abuse in the past, especially involving famous people, uh, that they will face in future, despite the fact that this investigation was reviewed by four people who pronounced it a good investigation. Fiona. Tom Sams in Swindon, thank you. Here, Wiltshire police have concluded the former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, would have been questioned on seven counts of suspected child abuse and sexual assault had he still been alive. Their report, which includes a claim Sir Edward raped an 11-year-old boy, has itself faced sharp criticism. Rebecca Barry reports. The Queen has asked me to form the next government. In the 1970s, he led the UK as Prime Minister, but now another description of Sir Edward Heath will be added to the annals of history. If he was alive, he would have been questioned about allegations of child sex abuse. The allegations against him were of the utmost seriousness and from a significant number of people. It is not our role to prove the innocence or guilt, <laughs> but to simply present the facts. It's two years since police made this startling appeal at the gates of the late Prime Minister's home. If you have been a victim or you're a witness to anything... So after one and a half million pounds spent investigating claims from 40 people, what have detectives found? Had he been alive, Sir Edward Heath would have been interviewed under caution about allegations made by seven people, covering three decades, from 1961 to 1992. They include allegations that he raped or indecently assaulted five boys, one as young as ten. Some people will now always affiliate Ted Heath's name with allegations of child sex abuse. Are they right or are they wrong? It is not for the police uh, to suggest imply or infer Sir Edward Heath was guilty or innocent of any of the allegations. Sir Edward Heath's home, now a museum, celebrating his political career. This is where ever-present armed police would monitor every coming and going. Proof, say his supporters, that the allegations can't be true. But when detectives arrived at these gates two years ago, all that history was thrown into question. I think it's been a wild goose chase and I would like that established. Whether that restores his reputation, I don't know. Police describe this as a watershed moment, 
for anyone suggesting there's been a state cover-up of abuse. It certainly has been a defining moment for the reputation of the late Sir Edward Heath. Rebecca Barry, ITV News. The former Conservative Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, would have been questioned over seven allegations of sex abuse if he had still been alive when the claims emerged. Wiltshire Police defended their decision to pursue the investigation, but stressed today's report did not imply any inference of guilt. Sir Edward Heath's supporters said that they were convinced all the allegations would be found to be groundless. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, is outside Sir Edward's former home in Salisbury. Michael. Well, John, there have been an extraordinary number of uh, allegations of historic child sex abuse against big-name figures in recent years, but surely none was more extraordinary or big-name than Sir Edward Heath, the former Prime Minister. A couple of years ago, police famously stood outside the gates here and appealed for possible victims uh, to come forward. As a result of that, a number of people did, and now they say there are seven cases which, were Sir Edward still alive, they would want to interview him about them uh, under uh, caution. But this document that's come out today about Operation Conifer doesn't really give us much detail about those seven cases. Indeed, much of the document is very defensive, explaining the extent, the scale, the cost uh, of the police operation and what they did. Interestingly, one of the things they did, as well as appealing for victims, they went out and approached people, anybody they could think of, who knew Sir Edward, drivers, protection officers, people who'd worked with him in government, people who'd sailed on his yachts. And they say that of the hundreds of people they approached, nobody came forward with anything untoward. ...has spent the election campaign touring the country. Today, police reported on the most serious inquiry they've ever carried out into the past conduct of a British Prime Minister, the man who held office from 1970 to 74. We'd like quite a lot of them, really. No, 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 I don't think it really is. I am satisfied, satisfied. There are compelling and obvious reasons to investigate allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. The Wiltshire Forces inquiry took two years, cost one and a half million pounds, attracted huge criticism, but today produced no hard conclusions. The allegations against him were of the utmost seriousness and from a significant number of people. I hope people will understand that given these circumstances, it would be an indefensible dereliction of a Chief Constable's duty not to have investigated the allegations against a former Prime Minister, even though he is deceased. Police received allegations of abuse by he against 40 possible victims, but they whittled these down to just seven cases which they'd pursue were he still alive. In the case of seven individual disclosures, if Sir Edward Heath had been alive today, it has been concluded he would have been interviewed under caution in order to obtain his account in relation to the allegations made against him. The seven cases they'd like to have explored range over 30 years, from Heath's time as a senior minister under Macmillan to being the longest serving MP in the early 90s. But police stress that though they'd like to have questioned him, that doesn't imply guilt. First, in 1961, when a cabinet minister it's alleged Heath raped an 11-year-old boy during paid sex in a dwelling in London. Then, a year later, while with another man, he's alleged to have indecently assaulted a boy of 10 in public in Kent. Around 1964, he's accused of indecent assault on a 15-year-old during paid sex on three occasions in Sussex and London. In 1967, while leader of the opposition, there's an alleged indecent assault on a 15-year-old in Guernsey. And after he was Prime Minister in 1976, he's accused of indecently assaulting an adult in Jersey. And finally, around 1992, while still an MP, he's alleged to have indecently assaulted a man after consent was withdrawn during paid sex in Wiltshire. But the police say that on the seventh allegation, around 1990, there's also evidence to undermine it. 
Two years ago, Edward Heath's friends were angry when police stood outside his old home in Salisbury to appeal for people to come forward with allegations. Today, Heath's friends called the police report profoundly unsatisfactory, as it neither justifies nor dispels the cloud of suspicion. What should happen now? Uh, that you should listen to what we're asking for, uh, which is that uh, the report is passed to a judge, but also the judge has access to all the evidence that the police had, so that effectively he is beginning, at the beginning, uh, taking everything into account and uh, coming to a conclusion about uh, Heath's uh, guilt and the reality, and not just leave speculation hanging. Sir Edward Heath died 12 years ago, the Prime Minister who took Britain into Europe. That legacy is now blighted, of course, by Brexit, and his personal reputation blighted perhaps forever by allegations that likely will never be proven one way or the other. Michael Crick reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to the Wiltshire Chief Constable, Mike Veal, and I started by asking him, since his investigation had spoken to more than 180 people associated with Edward Heath, had he been implicated by anyone who verifiably knew him? We have operated and investigated without fear or favour, which is an incredibly important element of our investigation. We have been open-minded in relation to our approach and conducted a meticulous and high-quality investigation. But I recognise this investigation and the report itself will raise more questions and answers. Um, but I've absolutely followed the legislation and followed the national guidance to the letter. And notwithstanding the legislation, I also believe that it's the right thing to do from a moral perspective and from a professional perspective. But I do understand that this has an impact on so many different people. Well, given that it does raise more questions than it answers, as you say, what happens now? The final report will be sent to the independent inquiry in, in, in relation to child sexual abuse. Uh, the senior investigating officer's final report will also be sent, and that will have uh, more detail in relation to the evidence uh, and to the victim's identity. It will then be a matter for the uh, child sexual abuse inquiry uh, to review that and then take the action that they feel appropriate at that time. So whether it is investigated further would be in their hands? We have done all that we can in relation to the allegations and in relation to the people that have come forward to date. It will be a matter for others to decide uh, what, how they conclude this investigation from an ICSA perspective. Understandably, the uh, evidential standard was relatively low. I mean, whether the account could physically have taken place as reported, whether there were inconsistencies uh, in relation to timing or location, and whether there was existence of third-party material uh, that contradicted the account, even whether there were available witnesses who could contradict the disclosure made by the victim. Now, uh, th that's a relatively low level of, of, of evidence, isn't it? Well, there's two things, John, that I need to emphasise. The first one is that there needs to be a presumption of innocence, and that presumption of in in innocence is absolutely enshrined in the criminal justice system. And the second thing is this, the threshold uh, of information or evidence accrued or obtained to interview someone after uh, caution is low level. And many, many people who have subsequently been found to be innocent are interviewed after caution. So I would caution anyone drawing any inference at all around guilt or innocence in relation to this low threshold. The, the former um, uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, Lord MacDonald, says it's no surprise that Wiltshire Police should have concluded that they would have interviewed Sir Edward had he been alive. But that does give what he calls a bogus credibility to their investigation without meaning anything in forensic terms. Well, of course, it has been particularly unhelpful, actually, John. Uh, over the last two years, there has been some misleading speculation and inaccurate information going into the public domain. We have been clear from the outset that we will not be making any inference or concluding uh, in any way that Sir Edward Heath was Ill innocent or guilty of any offences. That is not the role of the police. The role in the uh, criminal justice system of the police is very clear. Chief Constable, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you, Thanks. John. All the best. Thanks.
Today, Wiltshire police confirmed that the former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath, would have been interviewed under caution over claims of rape and abuse if he'd been alive when they came to light. The allegations include an alleged rape of an 11-year-old and four counts of indecent assault on boys under 14, seven claims in all. But they add that no inference of guilt should be drawn from the report that they put out today. I have ensured that this investigation has been conducted fairly has been conducted objectively and with respect and without fear or favour. We have gone where the evidence has taken us, whether it supports or negates the allegations. Most importantly, the report does not draw any conclusions as to the likely guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath or make any comment on the action the Crown Prosecution Service may have taken if he was alive today. Wiltshire Police. Well, Sir Edward Heath Foundation called it profoundly unsatisfactory and believe it neither justifies nor dispels the cloud of suspicion. So was it right to investigate or have police been overzealous in pursuing allegations of little credibility against public figures such as Sir Edward Heath. What should be the right way to proceed with claims of child abuse when it's impossible to put the defendant on trial? Joining me now, Dr Richard Hoskins, a criminologist and expert witness, called in by Wiltshire Police to review their own investigation, but who has subsequently criticised its handling. Uh, Dr Hoskins, just talk us through what you found then. Well, this time last year, Emily, I was presented by Wiltshire Police on Operation Conifer with two dossiers and an overview of the investigation. So they gave me a briefing which included the 40-odd allegations to that point that had been made against Edward Heath, 14 forces, and two dossiers. One was their own historic uh, witness statements, which went back into the 1980s, dated from the 1980s, but referred back to the 1950s, and Con Chief Constable Mikefield talked about that today. And the other was the Operation Midland Nick evidence, or so-called evidence. And uh, they presented these two dossiers to me and asked me to look at the allegations against Edward Heath. And I did that. I produced a 158-page report, which I have here. Um, it took me two months to compile, and I presented it to the police, and it didn't go down particularly well with them. Because you raised doubts here. I found that the allegations made were fantastical. I think I counted 30 murders in total against... Uh, um, innocent victims and uh, alleged victims, uh, 30, 30 murders in total, some of which included Edward Heath's involvement, apparently. Um, they were lurid and incredible uh, allegations. And I All of them? The ones that I looked at were. Now, the police then afterwards said, well, that was only one strand, but it was a very important strand in the investigation. And what was the reaction from the police when you raised these? They days? weren't happy with what I concluded and uh, I, they said I appeared to call into question the credibility of the witnesses. That was never my intention. I myself am a victim, a survivor if you like, of historic child sexual abuse. Somebody got 10 years for it. So I have no axe to grind and I am totally committed to the idea of investigating historic crimes against children, providing it's proportionate. And my criticism thereafter with the police is I think they should have called a halt at the point where I said, look, this evidence is not stacking up, it's fantastical, uh, they should have made it but more But they're not making that judgment, are they? I mean, you know, when people hear you say that you yourself are a victim or, or, or you have suffered mm. from sexual abuse in the past, they will surely think, well, that, that has to be right to allow the police to follow their investigation, the problem, doesn't it? It does, but the problem is we've had 20-plus officers and £1.5 million spent on this. And my concern here is that in pursuing what I think has been something of a gravy train down the celebrity route, the true victims... Gravy train, well, that's I a do. weird phrase, well, isn't it? it's not really. I think the amount of expenditure, if you look at the breakdown of expenditure, some of the things they've spent money on has been quite extraordinary, and it was released in some of the papers today. When you consider that normal, if you like, victims of child abuse that don't make them the mainstream press are suffering day to day, they're not getting this attention. The amount of police effort that has gone into this, I think, has been disproportionate. Dr Richard Hoskins, thanks very much indeed. Well, joining us now, Gabriel Shaw, Chief Executive of NAPAC, the National Association for Children Abused in Childhood, and Harvey Proctor, former Conservative MP, who received an apology after he was cleared of serious abuse claims 
by the Met last year. And if I can start with you, Harvey Proctor, you will recognise a lot of what Richard Hoskins uh, says there, your own experience of this. Yes. Uh, to be falsely accused is horrendous. I believe that Operation Conifer uh, was not expeditious. Police forces investigating live suspects have a duty in law to conduct their operations expeditiously. Conifer did not conduct itself expeditiously. When you look at this report today, though, um, Sir Edward Heath and those claims, allegations, seven counts, rape of an 11-year-old child, boy, um, cases of abuse, serious cases of sexual abuse against under-14s. What on earth would you say to people who were bringing these claims, allegations, that they shouldn't be considered, shouldn't be investigated? I said there should be an investigation but it should be proportionate to um, the resources and, and that are available. And this is disproportionate, you think? It is, because when we came this morning, Edward Heath was innocent. And still tonight, is. They said and there was tonight, no inference And tonight, appeal. Edward Heath is still innocent. There was nothing that Conifer could do about that because he was dead. But there was One. never going to be a surprise. I mean, the police were very, Wiltshire police were very uh, clear that this was never about finding Edward Heath guilty or otherwise. It was all about, is, does the um, evidence, does, does the allegations brought forward by these people meet the threshold, the evidential threshold for bringing him in for, for questioning under caution had he been alive? But were they the, too credulous, do you think, in, in all the stuff that they were looking over and you've ooh. heard from Dr Hoskins, were they too credulous? I don't think so. Out of the 40 allegations they investigated um, only only seven um, met that threshold and I hear what um, Dr Hoskins is saying about that and, and in the report itself in fact um, the Wiltshire police say the allegations of ritual abuse that were brought forward there no evidence to find that that happened so I believe it was proportionate. If you read through Operation Conifer as I've done today time and time and time again no cover-up no evidence from people who were around him, from friends, from fellow civil servants, politicians, cleaners, private secretaries, chauffeurs. So what do you do then when people are coming forward? Police cover protection officers. But when people are coming forward with these... All of which are negative comments. Now, that, the flavour of that did not come out at the uh, Wiltshire Police's press conference today. So they said this is about taking him in for questioning with very serious allegations. There is no well, presumption of uh, guilt. Can and we they not just... had reached that conclusion two years or more before today. Two years or more ago in okay, the report. You can, it, you it, can it, see how this would feel yeah. to somebody who and has been in the position, absolutely. who has been cleared, had the apology, and sees others going mm. through exactly the same thing all over again. Ted, he I, should I not, agree. Ted Heath's reputation agree. should never have had to go through this. It's monstrous of Wil uh, Wiltshire Police. But there's, a, but, there's a balance, but there's a balance to be struck, isn't there? And, um, and I hear what you're saying. Others have said today as well, this investigation should never have happened. My answer to that, or my question to that then would be, so what do we say? Do we say to these victims and survivors who have had the courage to come forward in a lot of cases, that that's it, we're sorry because he's dead or because the reputation is, is, his reputation is more important than your account? Gabriel, you what matters them more? victims or survivors, hmm. um, and that is clearly... A a specific choice of language. Yes. Um, yeah. t to Harvey Proctor, they wouldn't necessarily be victims or survivors, they'd be complainants yes. who are bringing a case that is yet unproven. It is a choice of language, but also it's worth pointing out, it's enshrined in policing, national police guidance um, to, give, um, to give the confidence to people to come forward, because so many people in the past who have come forward were not believed, were dismissed out of hand. And can I and say, this say is that about, I was, can I say that exactly. I was in, yeah. I was interviewed under caution twice under Operation Midland. And as a result of that, no file was passed to the CPS. And so this low hurdle of saying, with regard to Edward Heath, that in certain limited number of cases, they might have wanted to question Edward Heath under caution. I want to know from Chief Constable Veal, if he'd have said no, would they have arrested him? 
This clearly comes from a background that we're all aware of, the missed opportunity with Jimmy Savile and possibly it's our the response. pendulum swung too far and is still too far and Operation Conifer is the still the pendulum swinging too far in the National Police Service. But who no, decides the National, that? Well, yeah. The National Police Service, the National College of Policing, Operation Hydrant, Chief Constable um, Veal, Chief Constable Simon Bailey, the echelons of the police have I think not, it, I think it have goes, not followed it goes the advice widely. of, it have goes not followed the independent that. advice of Sir Richard Enriquez with regard to calling people complainants, not victims and survivors, and making sure that the allegations are fully investigated. But it's also true, isn't it, that the European Court of Human Rights says there is more of an obligation mm. to investigate those with high office because of all the worries about cover-up or... I never complained anger. about being investigated, but they had to investigate expeditiously in Midland, which they did not, and they didn't expeditiously investigate Gabriel, Ted Gabriel, do you feel Went on for far too long. Do you feel comfortable with the way police investigations are going now? Because mm. we've seen what happened with Harvey Proctor. We know where we are with Sir Edward yeah. Heath. It won't be the end. So what happens now? Where does this kind of investigation go with those who can't defend themselves? I think it's a, it's a, it's a constant negotiation, a constant, constant balancing act between the, you know, the, the, the encouraging victims and survivors to come forward and have the confidence because they have been failed in the past, failed dreadfully in the past, but at the same time, I mean, with Harvey's experience himself, that, um, that can also be too far the other way. So what we need to do now is where is the balance lie between the rights of, of, of those who have been accused of this abuse, mm. to have their reputations protected, and the rights of victims and survivors to be heard and respected. The balance Thank you should all. be obtained Thank by you. an investigation of Operation Conifer and national policing. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for coming in. I've been